Graham Hancock is a man who has built a career by, as he puts it, just asking questions. Most of these questions revolve around the narrative that there was once a super advanced race of people who lived on the earth around 20,000 years ago and were wiped out at some point by a cataclysmic event such as a flood. The survivors or refugees from this cataclysm then went about the world passing their advanced knowledge on to the people in the places they visited before vanishing without a trace. Hancock argues that although we don't know who these people are, we can see their influence in the archaeological record if we just look at the incredible achievements of the indigenous people all over the earth. Today we're going to take a look at one such place. In the first episode of Ancient Apocalypse, Graham Hancock's latest Netflix series, he and Indonesian geologist Danny Hillman take us to Gunung Padang, a megalithic site near Java that they argue has evidence for a 28,000 year old buried pyramid. My name is Zane and this is Unearthing History. Gunung Padang is a megalithic site in West Java, Indonesia. It was first reported on by Europeans in 1890 and is the first major site featured in Graham Hancock's Netflix series Ancient Apocalypse. The site sprawls across the top of a steep hill and an extinct volcano and to access Gunung Padang by foot, visitors must make their way up 370 andesite steps that bring them 95 meters or 312 feet to the summit which sits 885 meters above sea level. Upon reaching the top, visitors are greeted by a series of five terraces. Each are separated in elevation, shape and size, with the lowest terrace in elevation being the largest and the highest in elevation being the smallest. Four of the five terraces are trapezoidal in shape and one is rectangular and they lie along a central northwest southeast axis. Each of these artificial terraces is surrounded by large retaining walls, all of which are made from uncut basalt stones that were carried to the site from an unknown location and then stacked horizontally to form walls. Pottery fragments recovered from the site and dated by the Indonesian Bureau of Archaeology indicate that the site was first occupied sometime around 45 BCE or approximately 2000 years ago, which seems to override earlier claims by others who argued that the site was constructed as late as the 8th century CE. As I mentioned at the start of the video, the site was first documented by Dutch historian Roger Verbeek in 1890 and then again in 1914 by Dutch archaeologist Nicholas Johans Krom and then it was pretty much forgotten about until Indonesian farmers rediscovered the site in 1979. It is highly likely though that the indigenous Sundanese people who believe the site is evidence of King Silawangi's attempt to construct a palace in a single night and is therefore sacred, knew that the site existed since as far back as 1482. From this point on, Gunung Padang became a focal point for the various archaeological societies in Indonesia and investigation began wholeheartedly. Right, so that pretty much catches us up to the matter at hand, which is the 2014 excavations conducted by Danny Hillman, which alleged that Gunung Padang is actually a buried pyramid up to 28,000 years old. That's quite the leap from terraced hills made of preformed basalt columns, I agree, so let's take a look at Danny's evidence and see if this claim could possibly be true. I'm going to start by just telling you what Dr. Hillman and his team did, what their conclusions were, and then afterwards I'll present some criticisms from specialists as well as from myself, and some questions I have about the methods and the data. To get to the conclusion that Ganong Padang is a 28,000 year old pyramid, Danny and his team used ground penetrating radar, or GPR, to peer beneath the surface of the site and they say that the data gathered during this exercise shows large cavities below the surface indicating rooms or voids next to a giant pyramid. This preliminary survey generated a lot of popularity with Indonesia's government and the former president Susilo Yudhoyono made Hillman the lead of a new investigative team and gave him approximately 350,000 US dollars of funding to conduct an archaeological dig. This in itself was actually controversial at the time because there were many aspects of Indonesia's academic and public service sector that went on with far less funding and were arguably more important to everyday society. Anyway, what Danny Hillman and his team argue is that their excavations show three distinct subsurface layers of occupation. The first layer begins at surface level and continues to a depth of 3 meters and the team says that this layer dates to 3000 years ago. The second layer starts at 3 meters below the surface and continues to 15 meters below and they say that this layer dates to 7500 years ago. The third and final layer begins at 15 meters below the surface and this continues to an unknown depth and the team says that this layer dates to 9000 to 28000 years ago. Now, this is the part where I would usually use my experience dealing with archaeological data and reports and papers and things. Take a look at the data from the excavation and see what it says, except there isn't any data from the excavation. You see, 
Dr. Hillman's never published it, not in any official capacity anyway. For those unfamiliar with these types of investigations, typically an archaeological team doing an excavation will publish the methods used for the excavation, how they collected the samples and the analysis. They'll also publish the raw data, including images, how the dating samples were collected, as well as the raw data from those dating samples. Other important information that's included is whether there is any disturbance in the sediment from animals or insects, flood events, or any other natural animal or human phenomenon that could affect the interpretation of the sediment layers. People do this so that the wider community can examine the integrity of the research, point out any mistakes that may affect the data or conclusions, and just generally make sure everything is above board. But in this case, Dr. Hillman and his team haven't published any official data from the dig. And although I've reached out to Dr. Hillman a few months ago when I first posted about this on my TikTok, as of publishing this video, I have not heard back. It's also worth noting that Dr. Hillman has published at least 72 other geological papers that I was able to find since the 2014 excavations at the site, so this eliminates the possibility that Dr. Hillman just isn't working or publishing for whatever reason. Although it is worth adding that this isn't that abnormal for academia, I'm aware of excavations that took place in like 2013 that still have not been published 10 years later, so maybe we can give him the benefit of the doubt on this. But it's not a complete lost cause. You see, we do have some data from a poster that was presented at the American Geophysics Union in Washington DC in 2018. The title of this poster pretty much says it all, and I quote, Evidences of large pyramid-like structure predating 10,000 year BP at Mount Pudong, West Java, Indonesia. Now I'm not a geologist, I'm an archaeologist so I don't have the specific skill set required to interpret this geophysical data. However, I have spoken to geologists who have said that yes, the geophysical data shows that there are softer sections under the ground, but it does not indicate how soft it is in relation to the surrounding sediment. Basically what that means is that the data shows different densities underground, but it doesn't have a reference for how dense each one of these things are. One could be rock, one could be loose gravel, and they would show that yeah, there's different densities, but not how dense they are. The interpretation of these as voids cavities or pyramids is therefore impossible without digging. That's my understanding of the data, but again, I'm not a geologist. Luckily for us though, you don't have to take my word for it. You see, volcanologist Sutikno Bronto, who has been a loud critic of Hillman's team and the methods used, says, and I quote, Danny Hillman is not a volcanologist, I am, unquote and says that the mountain on which Ganung Padang sits is simply the neck of a nearby volcano. The excavation itself was also highly criticised. 34 Indonesian scientists, including archaeologists and geologists, expressed their unified concerns about the methods that Hillman and his team were using. For example, the team used shovels and hose instead of small handheld trowels to peel back the sediment millimetres at a time, and did not follow any of the standard archaeological procedures during the excavation. It has also been alleged that they removed buried basalt columnar joints without recording them at all, without taking photos or any kind of measurements, and this feels like an appropriate time to remind you all that context is everything when it comes to excavation. If we find an artifact, it tells us very little without knowing where that artifact came from. For example, if I was to find a viking amulet, you would say that's pretty cool. But if I tell you I found that viking amulet in Australia, in a layer of sediment that dates to 5,000 years ago, well that completely changes the picture. So far I've discussed criticisms from other people, but this is the point where I'd like to chime in and make my own. My first question is how can a layer be 3 meters or even 10 meters thick and only have a single date? That kind of dating implies that the layer formed instantaneously in a single event, which obviously isn't true. For some context on how much this can fluctuate, I've excavated rock shells in Western Australia that have had a 20,000 year difference over just 40 centimetres. I've also excavated at other sites where a 3 metre depth has represented 50,000 years. Which is why it leaves me scratching my head when the team says that the first layer that's 3 metres deep has a single date of 3,000 years, and then from 3 metres to 15 metres, which is a 12 metre gap, has a single date of 7,500 years. The only carbon dating data I can find from the site shows the various core drilling samples that were dated and what exactly was dated. And this one is really confusing too. So what they did here was actually carbon date sediment. Now, carbon dating relies on measuring carbon-14 from living things that have died. Once that thing dies, the radioactive decay essentially begins a clock that we can then measure and see how long that clock has been ticking. The problem with applying this method to sediment is that organic matter is consistently and continuously introduced into the soils through natural processes like fires, floods, penetration of plant roots, and animal and insect burrows. In fact, when we do date organic material like shellfish or charcoal in an excavation, we have to be very careful that the soil and our hands do not contaminate the sample and ruin the potential for dating. The 
other issue with carbon dating sediment samples from core drilling is that drilling has the potential to mix up the sediments, pushing newer sediment lower and bringing older sediment higher since it's essentially just a giant spinning drill. Unless I'm missing something completely here and there's a sediment expert out there who can correct me on this, these dates in my opinion are unreliable and completely irrelevant. The craziest part about this is that there's no way Dr. Hillman didn't know this information and yet he chose to carbon date sediment anyway when optically stimulated luminescence is the typical and more reliable method of directly dating sediment that archaeologists and geologists use all the time. I can't see any reason to do this other than to directly obfuscate the dating and I think it speaks a lot about the motivations of Dr. Hillman. Now typically I stick to the analysis of data rather than pointing to people's character, but in this case there's some vital information that is key to understanding why and how these conclusions were reached. You see, over the last 10 years, Dr. Hillman has claimed that 17 other hills in Indonesia are also buried pyramids, and in 2013 he published a book called Plato Never Lied, Atlantis is in Indonesia. To me, this makes it painfully obvious that Danny really wanted to find what he was looking for. This isn't forming a hypothesis, investigating the phenomena, and forming a conclusion based on the data. This is forming a conclusion and then investigating and manipulating the methods in a way that supports your conclusion. Indonesian scientists have also criticized Dr. Hillman's motivation because in a dig prior to meeting with the president and forming the task force, Dr. Hillman allegedly excavated 40 centimeters deep in a three meter long trench over the course of a two week dig. This is about the speed you would expect at an archeological dig. After meeting with the president, Hillman went to Gunung Padang and excavated 3.96 meters deep in two trenches in the same two week time period and as deep as 15 meters in another. It's reasonable to assume that the second dig would be faster given the assistance of the army, but that doesn't mean throwing caution to the wind and ripping everything out of the ground. That is, unless you already know what you're going to find, or at least pretend to find. Now, some of Indonesia's scientists also believe that this was politically motivated because a 20,000 year old pyramid in Indonesia would generate jobs and millions of dollars in tourism and swell national pride. They may be onto something because the dig's title was Operation Red and White Glory, with red and white being the colors of Indonesia's flag. Examples of just how powerful this buried pyramid sentiment can be comes from Bosnia, where businessman Semir Osmanagic claims to have found the largest human-made pyramids on Earth. This has caused racial tension through surging nationalistic pride and has generated significant political and economic gains. The narrative that archaeologists want to cover this up, which is touted by Hancock in the series, is also unfounded and provably false. Archaeologists find buried pyramids in Egypt pretty regularly, and we found two last year, and those weren't covered up. Sites that go against the established narrative, such as Gobekli Tepe, are also readily accepted when the evidence was found. For example, Gobekli Tepe showed us that hunter-gatherers were capable of building monumental cities, and prior to that, we'd always thought that agriculture was a key first step that allowed this to happen. When we found Gobekli Tepe, we changed that. We rewrote history because we found evidence. This proves that the narrative can change. There is no overlying conspiracy that we're trying to suppress as archaeologists, it's just that we need data. It's also painfully obvious to me that if there was a chance that this was true, archaeologists would jump at the chance to prove and publish that data because it would be an enormous boon to their careers. I mean, think about this just from a selfish perspective. Imagine you're the archaeologist that finds a lost civilization that built enormous pyramids only to be buried by the earth 28,000 years ago. This would be the biggest archaeological find of all time. So when Hancock repeatedly says that archaeologists are covering things up and hiding things from the public, I just think if you apply basic logic to this, it doesn't hold any water. But the main issue is that there is just a massive lack of data. If what Dr. Hillman says is true, there should be no issue in publishing the data for everyone to see. So why is there suddenly a change in Dr. Hillman's scientific rigor and publication capacity in comparison to his geological work? The obviously conflicting interests from his book and claims of other pyramids combined with the lack of credible methods and analysis is just too many red flags. Don't forget that these are available on YouTube with attached videos and supplementary data and also available wherever you get your podcasts. If you like the content and you're looking for more, you can head over to my YouTube, TikTok, and Instagram, where I post daily archaeological content in short form videos. If you're more of a gamer and you like to fool around and make terrible jokes, well, you can head over to my Twitch, where I streamed four days a week playing a bunch of different games. There's links to all of those in the show notes. As always, thank you for listening. My name is Zane, and this has been Unearthing History.